doing keto and carnivore is, is a deuterium depletion. And they're also making more um, water in the mitochondria. And as I've said before, we, we are a giant water being. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching our videos. If you'd like to support us some more, you can explore our homemade natural skincare products at purelytallow.com. Thank you so much for supporting my small business. Hey everybody, welcome to the Carnivore Revolution. I'm Serena and today my guest is Sarah Pugh. She has a PhD in molecular mechanisms, quantum biology certification, and a ketogenic therapy certification. And I'm so grateful that you could make the time to spend with us today, Sarah. Well, thank you, Serena. It's really lovely to be here. So we're going to talk about lots of stuff today. So we're going to talk about um, uh, being a female and what that does to our weight, along with our hormones, some leptin stuff, uh, withdrawing from sugar. I do want to get into a little bit about ketogenic diets and whether or not that's something that you recommend. And then I also want to talk about fasting and cold exposure. So those are some of the topics that we're going to talk about today. And of course, we will go on random rabbit holes and talk about different things. Um, but let's get started with your story and how you ended up not really practicing uh, what you went to school for. Oh, right. Yes, because I uh, was a biochemist uh, originally, and, and I have done projects on dopamine receptors, genetic promoters in moss. Uh, then I did a PhD and it was on protein folding. So that relates to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. But I did uh, biophysics then. So that's when I first got exposed to quantum physics and quantum biology. But I didn't really have any understanding of how it applied to daily life. Then I did a project on statins and heart disease and cholesterol. And that was what finished me off with not having faith in scientific research because I could see all the behind scenes of how there's pressure to publish data to show pharmaceuticals being favorable or cholesterol being dangerous and then I used to get lots of backache and neck ache from working in a lab along with other things so I just left in a, in a big huff and became a Pilates teacher and I did hypnosis as well which is actually really helpful for mindset but I've always been interested in biochemistry and supplements and nutrition so I was able to start to incorporate that because when you start working with real humans not in a laboratory it's a totally different uh, experience. Then I um, got into ketogenic diets and quantum biology and all things uh, related to that. So, And I've also done functional neurology. So I've got quite a lot of different lenses I can look at people through because, you know, I don't believe one size fits all. We're all at N equals one. There's no magic protocol. There's no magic pill, no magic way of eating. Uh, and my favorite saying, it probably it depends. It depends on the context. So that's how I got to where I am. And because my background did have a very strong element of physics. I like to look at the body through a physics lens and it sounds complicated, but it actually really simplifies how the mitochondria work, why water is important, why light is important, why ketogenics work, uh, ketogenic diets work at a sort of more scientific uh, levels. And I like uh, teaching the general public about science because I think it's taught really badly in school. Textbooks are really biased because the, the food companies, the cereal companies and such like have had their tentacles in it. And we do learn a few useful sort of skills and, and stuff at school, but then sometimes it's not relevant to, to daily life. And I think uh, that's what's sort of missing uh, with, with science uh, these days. It should be made more practical and more sort of health orientated at school. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. You mentioned cholesterol um, and that that was one of the major like triggers for you because they want to just prescribe everybody a statin, right? So um, tell me what you think about cholesterol and specifically its effects on things like Alzheimer's and dementia. Yeah, well, look, cholesterol is absolutely vital because it's that important our body makes it. And it's also not just related to diet. It, we, it's very related to light because we make vitamin D out of cholesterol and there's a chronic sort of problem all over the world with low vitamin D. And that's partly why some people might get a high, might get a, an unusual lipid panel. But then also with cholesterol, it makes all of our sex hormones because pregnenolone gets made out of cholesterol. It's really important as an anti-inflammatory agent. We, we need it as an, for our immune system because on our skin there's cholesterol and that helps to blind microbes. So it's they do something called quorum sensing. So if you've got a decent amount of cholesterol in your skin, even if you cut yourself, you can defend against microbes. Because even just some people I know, even 
if they scratch themselves, sometimes that can blow up into sort of a huge infection. And I think just cholesterol, like a lot of other things, like ultraviolet light has been demonized because if you lower people's cholesterol or tell them not to go outside, you're making new customers because again, the brain I think is something like 25% cholesterol. So, and it's like the brain's also about 70%, if not more of exclusion zone water. So it's there for a reason. And I think using medication to try and take away something that we make ourselves and demonize this molecule is terrible. But there's also lots of studies, I think, particularly in prisons and with uh, children with more uh, young people who've got low cholesterol with sort of violent behavior and mood disorders. But, but also there's so many things that cholesterol does. I don't want to go off on a big tangent and it does things like stabilizing the cell membrane and putting receptors together in sort of rafts. So, so that's important for neurotransmitter uh, function, although that's not the be all and end all of how neurology works. I just think there's so much that uh, cholesterol does and there's so many myths. I mean, even just saying things like good and bad cholesterol, there's only one kind of cholesterol in the textbook. It, and even at the level of doctors not being able to interpret a lipid panel properly because they don't even look at the HDL to triglycerides ratio. And, and really in that panel, the, the two important things are HDL and triglycerides, whereas there's just this fixation on poor old LDL when really the cholesterol system with, with the lipoproteins is just sort of like a postal service with, with uh, packages being delivered or not delivered. And um, I just think it's just some kind of stunt from people who just want to sell medication, to be honest. Yeah. And when we say that, so many people say, oh, so you think there's some big conspiracy theory. I do think there's a little bit of a conspiracy going on um, when it comes to that, because um, and maybe you could explain this better than I can, but the pharmaceutical companies have some impact on the insurance companies and what the insurance companies will cover and getting them to say, oh, well, you know, that cholesterol needs to be considered too high now, or let's lower the blood pressure numbers and things like that. And um, I've seen study, I mean, I've seen, you know, real information about that, that the pharmaceutical companies do have an impact on those things. Oh, yeah, definitely. But also they don't understand um, the light aspect of cholesterol because it's something called a, a time crystal. It's a sort of time telling molecule to do with seasonal changes. And I just think it's something that is so is so misunderstood that it's, again, just a money spinner because you get a double whammy with the sun and um, the cholesterol. Because if you tell people not to go outside, they make less vitamin D and make more cholesterol because it builds up. And then if you tell people to eat inappropriately, you can just make cholesterol out of anything. And, and again, there's sort of movement to try and demonize red meat. And we know all about Ansel Keys and the saturated fat. So it, it's just a particular sort of goalpost that they set. And they sometimes keep lowering the goalpost for acceptable ranges in order to sort of make money out of a medication. And it's one of these things that I've kind of, since studying cholesterol more at a quantum level about light and what it does, it just makes me even angrier because it's it, it's basically so fundamental for how our bodies tell the time. And if we don't have a good body clock, then that's another recipe for more pharmaceuticals. Because I think something like 60 or 70 percent of pharmaceuticals affect our circadian genes or clocks in some way. And if you mess all of that up with statins, I, I haven't got any evidence for this, but I think if you disturb cholesterol, you disturb time telling in the body. And again, it just is another way to make more customers and more sick people. And again, it's like we know, it's sort of a ploy to push um, things like Kellogg's or cereal or sort of plant-based products and put uh, farms and dairy farms and such like out of business. So, so there's all sorts going on in the background. And I wouldn't say it's a conspiracy theory because if you look at all of the economics of it and look at cholesterol through different lenses, you can just see how ridiculous it is. But it takes such a long time for information to filter out from say people on the front the fringes of research into sort of medical training or textbooks it can t a textbook's usually 10 years out of date and then you've got another 10 years while it filters down to the general public 
so they're, they're ba- the general public are basically 20 years behind mm-hmm. where we are right now with cholesterol being something vital for our life because it's a bit like insulin cortisol if we don't have any of those we die so, so this idea of demonizing particular molecules is just insane to me because there's nothing good or bad it's just all about balance and context yeah and what i have seen is you know you're talking about like it being behind like the general public is 20 years behind the doctors even are you know 10 years behind i think because of those textbooks and the way the information filters when i asked my doctor's office to break down my cholesterol into pattern a and pattern b they didn't know what that was and to me that was very shocking and then i wanted to ask you and you may not have seen this it's a, it's an american made um series on hulu i think have you seen dope sick Oh, my um, really good friend has told me to watch Dope Sick because I don't have a TV or Netflix or anything. Okay. But yeah. I, I do know she she told me in detail about that particular series and I really wanted to watch it because isn't that all about the painkiller industry and um, all, of, all of the corruption and yes. the degradation of all of these poor people into sort of poverty or illness or death so yes that's definitely dope sick is something that if i could find somewhere to watch it i definitely would she said it's horrifying horrifying now if you're watching this and you're curious about it do not watch it with your children it is bad i mean i wouldn't i don't want to watch it with my adult children um that's how bad some of the stuff is in there um but it actually happened where i live the courthouse that they portray in the movie i can almost see it from my house and so this happened here Um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, where the pharmaceutical companies went after um, with a painkiller in in order to keep it from having a black label on it, meaning, you know, that it was an addictive narcotic. It's Um, the pharmaceutical company. The actual painkiller. It's OxyContin was the one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And they managed to, they managed to like con their way into not having that black label. And the whole thing is about the pharmaceutical companies and the way the pharmaceutical reps reps celebrate when they sell more of this medicine instead of looking at like selling more of this medicine means people are sick it means people need help and then as the people were getting addicted to it they made up new rules as they went and the fda didn't stop them i mean it's really eye-opening and it's for me while i was watching it because i don't have a problem with drugs and i've never had a problem with drugs i have had a problem with food though and carbohydrates and sugar i am definitely a carb and food and sugar addict hands down, I am an addict. And so I kept relating it to that. And I do believe those same kinds of things are happening in the food industry. That's what I kept relating it to the whole time was the food industry and how they get us addicted with the bliss point and and keep all of that going and how hard it is to withdraw from those foods and the sugars in the same way that it's hard to withdraw from the drugs. And so I think I think everybody should watch Dope Sick and I think they should have an open mind. I was shocked. I was yelling at one point. I was crying at one point. I was just livid and angry at one point watching it. It's really, really scary that people can make up their own rules and have people like the FDA and the food industries just go along with it when they're supposed to be protecting us. Yeah, I know. I just take a lot of what the FDA says with a pinch of salt now and mm-hmm. the who. So they're they're correct sometimes mm-hmm. and they are right. And that's the problem because people then think everything they say is correct. But yeah, they do have their own rules and move the goalposts. And it's not just about pharmaceuticals and food. There are just so many other examples of these kind of multi-billion or even trillion dollar companies like apple's a multi-trillion dollar company now they have so much money they can manipulate the research and pretend things are safe when they're not just because they are looking for you know a billion dollar payout yeah and even after a lawsuit the company that is portrayed in the movie even after the lawsuit and the company having to file bankruptcy and going through all of this um one of the head guys just bought like mick jagger's old house in the uk or something so believe me they're not suffering after killing thousands of people with those drugs and making people very addicted and ruining people's lives there were schools near here there were counties near here that had to close the schools because there were so few t- children left to go to school and so i think it's a great movie again a a great series and i think people should watch that and then do research on the fda and the drug companies and things like that and find out how all of that works because so many of the studies are sponsored by the pharmaceutical companies or the food industries and most of those studies if somebody sponsors them most of the studies come out in favor of the people you know who are sponsoring it so i think that's important for people to remember when we're talking about conspiracies um so now i wanted to talk about hormones and leptin 
and how that works for people along with cortisol. I just turned 50 last May and had lost 35 pounds on the carnivore diet and 15 pounds has found it way its way back even with the absence of carbs and it seems like no matter what i do and it feels like uh i'm obsessing about it you know at this point whereas when i was losing the 35 pounds i was very um i was very lighthearted about it it was it was coming off slowly i felt good i was doing what i needed to be doing and then the 15 pounds comes back and suddenly you're like panicked about it, right? Like upset about it, which probably just makes it worse. And so, um, so I recently started hormone replacement therapy because I wasn't sleeping. I was anxious all the time. My um, progesterone and estrogen had just completely plummeted. And so I don't know how you feel about hormone replacement therapy, but, um, but just in general, I feel like my cortisol is high. And I know so many other women that are in my age group that are dealing with uh, menopause and things like that are going through the same thing. So maybe we could help people here kind of figure out what we need to do when our cortisol is high, um, when we have leptin resistance and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, I'll start with uh, cortisol because it's okay. um, something that people talk about a lot and it's a light, it's very light driven. So basically daylight is when we produce the most cortisol and then obviously at night when we want to sleep, we would produce mm -hmm. melatonin. It's not that simple, but just for simplicity today. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the main mistakes that people make with cortisol, they uh, blame it on the partners and fasting and cold plunges and work and menopauses, whereas they seem to forget that um, blue light or artificial blue light is really going to ramp up cortisol because it, um, there's a particular peptide called POMC and it gets cleaved into something called ACTH and that elevates cortisol and insulin and your blood sugar. There's some other parts to this, but the main take home message is blue light is something that's going to chronically raise your cortisol. And when it comes to sex hormones, we, we don't want something called a pregnenolone steal where our body basically decides cortisol is that important because without it, we die. And it does have useful properties in the short term, like being anti-inflammatory, but we want our bodies to make other hormones like DH. EA, um, testosterone, estradiol, and progesterone. And if your body's busy making all of this uh, cortisol and we don't have the other hormones, then straight away that's going to cause an imbalance. And the other problem with too much artificial blue light is, particularly after about 12 lunchtime, is it you can encourage too much estrogen production. And if we're sitting in blue light all day, then the cortisol is being made instead of progesterone and we need progesterone for sleeping. And because I'm 47, I don't have any hormone problems at the moment. And it's one of those things, I think it's very interesting, the menopause, but that because I honor sort of the darkness in winter, I have noticed I've been sleeping really well. I'm in a good mood and my cycles are much longer than they used to because I'm not let allowing the artificial light to basically steal my my cortisol will steal my pr progesterone and make too much cortisol you you mentioned also about addictions and stuff that the artificial blue light also steals our dopamine and that's really important for anybody who's struggled with any addiction because when they get low in dopamine they're going to default back to their you know most favored addiction pathway i don't like ever calling somebody an addict because there are certain things that i think naturally we are we're supposed to get addicted to for example sunlight where primed to get addicted to that to go outside for good reasons so addiction pathways exist in our bodies naturally in the same way as when we in cavemen times if people went out on a big hunt and it was really exciting and they got a massive got into a flow state and had a big dopamine and noradrenaline rush, it made them addicted to, to this excitement. Otherwise, we'd have just hidden in our caves. So our brains and our neurotransmitters and everything are hardwired in, in some sense for pleasure. It's just it depends what we try, what we choose to stimulate our, our own. So that's uh, one aspect of uh, looking at hormones. I would just sort of look, look at the light environment because I know... I don't have any issues with people at, or um, bioidenticals. I think T.S. Wiley's book on sex lies in the menopause is one of the best books I've read on using bioidentical hormone replacement. And she is a polymath, except I just think if somebody's got a lot of deuterium in their body, adding exogenous hormones on top, anything, including growth hormone that some people like to use as they get older, I just think it's 
an unwise idea. You want to make your own body, like make your terrain and your environment and your water, as in what you drink and what you make in your mitochondria, all of that as and your light environment as good as you possibly can. And then maybe try bioidentical hormones later, because sometimes people find that the problems go away because they've looked at their life through a different lens, not not just the sort of biochemistry or food lens. But on the other hand, if you want to do bioidenticals, I think it's really important to get something like a Dutch test because it tells you a lot more and how you metabolize estrogen. And also, to, I mean, it depends if someone's menstruating or not to actually measure things because there are specific ratios of estradiol and progesterone that there should be. And also testosterone can be important for some women. Again, some women in the menopause get high testosterone and other women, that's the hormone that's missing. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it because again, you can just go all on symptoms because some people's labs look fine and they've got horrific symptoms and other people are the opposite. And if taking an exogenous hormone allows a husband or a wife to be able to have a normal life again, I haven't really got an issue with that, but I just think it's always better if you're going to add things to your body, make sure that you're in the best possible condition to receive the, these um, exogenous hormones and not to go for them straight away because sometimes you can fix it to yourself. Because I mean, women have been having menopauses for, uh, and uh, some it's not good and others like my mum said, didn't feel any different. So it is possible to have a, a peaceful menopause. Yeah, so what about leptin resistance? What is that? And are there things we can do about it? Yeah, definitely, because leptin's another circadian hormone, but just in simple terms, what it does is it's like an energy accountant. So it measures how much energy we have on board and it, it reports to the hypothalamus at night, sort of like a CEO uh, in a company has an accountant who tells them how much they can or can't spend the next day. And then it's going to modulate your appetite and metabolism the next day. Also, leptin's not just about weight. It's uh, very high up in the hormone hierarchy. So it's got a hold over insulin. It can control thyroid hormones. And then collectively, those can all control sex hormones, which are right down the bottom. So things like oxytocin and um, melatonin and um, leptin are up here. And then there's like a cascade. So I'd always go for leptin and those higher up hormones first, because again, insulin resistance comes after leptin resistance. So if somebody does have diabetes or insulin resistance, they're probably going to be leptin resistant anyway, or, or very pretty much always because it's part of a progression in how things go wrong in the body. And the other thing that's interesting about leptin is it's, you know, could go on for, for a long time about this. And it is the work of Dr. Jack Cruz, who is the expert, but he does sometimes make things very difficult to, to understand. And because leptin's found underneath the skin in the body fat, our skin is like our solar panel. So the leptin in effect can measure how much energy we get from sunlight. And if we don't get enough, that's a problem and it's an energy sort of crisis. Because whenever we lose energy somehow, for example, say drinking alcohol, that steals electrons, that's energy loss. If we have fluoride in our water, that disturbs our water battery because fluoride also steals electrons. So those are two things that are causing the body to sense an energy deficit. The other thing that's really interesting about sunlight is that the red and the near infrared allow the ATPAs in the mitochondria to spin without any food electrons. So if people are not getting um, out enough, or ATP as in energy, if people are not getting outside enough and making basically ATP for free without food, the body's also going to want more food electrons. So again, that's another sort of aspect of leptin resistance, not enough sunlight. And then very, very basically, say grounding and being connected to the earth, we can draw in electrons from the earth. And in terms of how we work, we need electrons in our body because they flow and they don't actually produce current, they produce an electric field. But when we have no electrons flowing, that means we're dead. And the more we have, the less, in, the less inflammation we have and the better our redox. And if we don't ground enough and are never connected uh, to the earth, it's sort of, we're missing a fundamental source of electrons. And then if we don't have enough, even if we do go out in the sun, the, the photoelectric effect described by Einstein is how the sunlight charges our electrons. And this all feeds into our sort of water battery, which 
Um, we are sort of 99 molecules of water and one of human for a reason. So the water's just not sitting there. And the the in, the near infrared spectrum of the sun can actually charge our water battery, as can other things as well. So in a way, leptin resistance is a lack of energy in the body because we're leaking it or, or, or losing it or not making enough of it. And then on another term of sort of like circadian biology, if people are getting up in the morning and never eating breakfast and ever and fasting and doing CrossFit, food's also a timekeeper as well. So that's one way that's not to do with light and water and magnetism. We mess up leptin would be to persistently sort of miss miss breakfast and not provide that uh, time signal along with seeing the sunrise. And then the other one where people can get leptin resistance, it's, it's all tied in together, is eating too late in the evening because that's going to spike insulin and then insulin is going to disturb leptin when it wants to dock in the hypothalamus to say how much um, energy is on board. And again, people probably know they shouldn't be eating before bed. And then again, very sort of much older research, too much fructose, blinds the leptin receptor as well. So, so there's multiple reasons of how we can become leptin resistant, although it primarily is sort of a circadian and light driven hormone. And it's, there's also the component of ultraviolet light, because if we have a tan and we have melanin, it's not just a sun tan, it's something that can split water. And it does more than that. But again, if you can split water and reform it in your body using something like melanin, again, it's an energy source because the body can split water into electrons and hydrogen and oxygen. And the, that's the, the, the hydrogen and the electron are fundamentally our energy source. So even if this might be confusing to people, when we think about food, what happens in the great big complicated cycles like glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, all the mitochondria are after, they just want the electrons and the protons from the food. So what I'm trying to ex explain is there's lots of other ways to get electrons and protons as well. Like your gut microbiome, if it's happy, it'll make hydrogen for you. So when a person finds themselves in a situation where they're sort of defying the laws of thermodynamics and gaining weight out of thin air, which I've heard a lot. There's obviously something going on on an energetic level with the person that they may have not considered other than food. Because I know people eat exactly the same and they're very sort of, I don't want to say regimented, they're very organised about it and it used to work and then all of a sudden it stops working. And that's why I think a quantum biology and light and water and grounding and other things are really important to look at because from the way the body works it makes perfect sense and again I do work with clients and people so I know that it's another route into managing sort of issues with weight or food and other things that people have. So don't sleep in, right? Like I feel like if my cortisol is high and I'm really stressed, I should sleep in and get as much sleep as I need. But probably I should go ahead and get up right before the sun comes up, go stand in the grass and watch the sun come up and then go for a walk. Does that sound like that's better than sleeping in for somebody who may be having some issues with cortisol or leptin? Oh yeah, definitely. Because also the the um the thyroid system's very tied to the sunrise. And um, the central retinal pathway, that gets activated at, at sunrise. And then that's like a cascade. So it sets off all the rest of the hormones uh, for the day. So it's one of these things that it's it's about understanding why you wake, woke up with high cortisol in the first place, because it's very likely something you did, not just the, the evening, but probably in the morning of the day before, because setting our body clock starts in the morning because we want to see the sunrise, set off the hormone cascade. Yes, go grounding and, and go for a walk, move about a bit because that moves your fascia and you can produce electrons that way and it's, it's it's good for your brain and i have found that say if i woke up early if you if you lie there just stressing about everything it kind of makes it worse whereas if you if you actually get up and get going it might be uncomfortable for a couple of days but that's the same with everything of making a new habit your brain's going to pr protest in the beginning but it's going to be better later so you want you definitely do want to see the sunrise especially if you've got hormone problems but i just think it's 
like not eating processed food. I just think it's like non-negotiable if, if that makes sense. And, and it's something if I can't, if a situation arises, if I go somewhere or something happens and I can't see the sunrise, I'll go crazy because it's so ingrained. And I used to love like having lies in before I knew about this. So yeah, I think it is important, especially if someone's got thyroid issues to, to see the morning sun and definitely for leptin because you want to start to retrain uh, your uh, circadian rhythm. But it's also really important for preventing cancer as well, because if your body clock, as in your master clock, is out of line, the way the body propagates the information, it oscillates down the body to the organs, and then every organ has cells, and each of those cells has a clock in it. And the cell cycle, as in just very simply of whether a cell should die or live, is the cell cycle. So if your body clock's misaligned, then your body isn't sure, should I kill this cell or should I let it live? Uh, and that there are numerous studies on uh, bad circadian rhythms and cancer and diabetes and heart disease and depression and things like that. So it's something we've known about for a long time. Um, so definitely, yes, I think somebody sh should see the sunrise. And also they're really beautiful as well. Uh, and even if it's cloudy, you, you still get benefits because there's always going to be the signal from the sun and then there's always going to be the near infrared light the one I was saying that can penetrate really deep into into our bodies and concentrate in important parts like our cerebral spinal fluid or brain or, or mitochondria and that's always available even if it's cloudy so, so no matter what and there's always electrons outside and, it, and it's better than than being inside so I do think it's something that's important and even if it sounds like a pain for people, if you can do it, de definitely do it. I appreciate some people have got to go to work or take children to school, but you can still open the window in um, in, in the car or, or at work or, or sneak out because a little bit's always better than nothing. Okay. And go ahead and eat breakfast then too that early because like we're conditioned to fast, right? Like don't break your fast until after lunch. Don't break your fast until after you work out. Like if everything is all about fasting. So do we go ahead and eat breakfast that early too? Is that how we kind of set our, our bodies up for starting the day? Yeah, because um, if you have, it, cortisol is really high in the morning anyway. So obviously the first thing is not to have a coffee straight away because you'll blow your own head off. Mm -hmm. um, and having breakfast a timekeeper, and also I haven't. I think fasting is brilliant. And when people have reset their leptin or e eaten in a more sensible way, I've found if I've had enough in the day, I'll, I'll skip dinner because again, eating after sunset or eating too late is going to not only disturb leptin, but the gut wants to go to bed. And once it's got dark, your body thinks it's night time and it isn't, and the mitochondria are not expecting food. So yeah, definitely, uh, that's the thing about fasting. I, I think especially for women over a certain age if you want to do it just just miss dinner because I just think the morning uh, part is, is that important and I've just seen so many people I used to fast in the morning and not eat till four o'clock and then uh, you know I thought that was normal and then d found out for multiple reasons it wasn't the right way around so I haven't got anything any issues with fasting um, I just think sometimes forcing your body to do something like not eating when it really wants to isn't a good idea whereas forcing it to see the sunrise which is it's supposed to see that it is fine so that's my sort of thoughts on on cortisol and in particular uh and and fasting so when do you recommend fasting and for how long like what what is your preference for that? Do you like 72 hour fast for people, 36 hour fast, or just kind of that intermittent fasting from, you know, like mid afternoon until morning? Um, I think it depends on the context, because if somebody's already leptin resistant, if you try and fast, because when we fast, we activate the AMPK pathway. And that doesn't work properly if you've got leptin resistance. So what happens then in the mitochondria? Um, they panic and it, it, sometimes too much fasting, too much autophagy means the body is running out of tissue. So it's going to start digging into your stem cells early and you definitely don't want that. So, so that's my issue with fasting. If there's something wrong with your metabolism you're, and your body's sensing you're in starvation mode, because even obese people can be in starvation mode because of leptin or somebody already with a history of disordered eating, trying to fast and restrict even more, your body's going to react in an adverse way. So there's a time and a place uh, for, for fasting. And also like anything, people will do it to excess because personally, if I'm going to do it, I'll miss dinner. I don't do it every single day, but sometimes 
I just think, what's the point of eating? You're not even hungry. So that, that so I wouldn't do it then. And then if I do do longer fasts, I do 48 hours or 72 hours, say once a month or once every six weeks. And I always fast if I'm traveling for 48 hours because there's so much disruption with jet lag and non-native EMFs and blue lights in, in, in airports. And also it stops me eating anything at all. Because even if something might look low carb on the airplane, mm -hmm. goodness knows what animal it might even be. They might say it's beef, but, you know, it could be anything, could be something that's been scraped off the road. So, you know, I think it's just fasting obviously has a very strong spiritual and religious um, aspect to it. So I think there's a really good aspect there of going without delaying gratification or even for people who've never done anything other than eat six meals a day just fasting for them teaches them about true hunger but there's always people that will do something to excess um and then cause problems for themselves because fasting should be kind of fun and enjoyable if you're in the right state whereas if people are forcing themselves to do it they're just obsessing oh i can't wait to have my dinner and that's all they'll think about all morning and again sometimes people's hormones they just haven't got the capacity or the energy or the progesterone or whatever to be able to sustain uh doing a fast and, and it's just something that you should everybody's an individual and an n equals one and also it's it's more natural to fast in the winter because it's a, a season of scarcity whereas in the summer where the fruit when the fruit's out even if people don't eat fruit you, your your biology knows it's there and it wants to eat it so i've always found doing fasting or strict keto at that time of the year is always much more difficult because it's going against what nature is, it has on offer yeah that makes perfect sense so what about ketosis you mentioned ketosis a couple of minutes ago what do you think about ketosis is it good long term can that damage things can that cause more trouble for people with cortisol and leptin issues uh yeah obviously with, with keto i i do it myself and i'm trained in it and i think because of there's so much um extra burden on our bodies like uh, non-native emfs that affect our mitochondria and stop them making water and all the blue light that shoves our blood sugar up it, it's extremely foolish to not do something that's low carb because low carb could mean 50 to 100 grams for, mm -hmm. for a certain person so there's that to start with because the, the main reason i think a keto diet's important is it, it, it our bodies can make twice as much water from a fat-based diet than they can from a carbohydrate-based diet and secondly fat is very low in deuterium and carbs are not and deuterium is just an isotope of hydrogen and it, it's not evil or anything it's just there but it's only a problem when we have too much of it and i think a lot of the benefits that people see from doing keto and carnivores is, is a deuterium depletion and they're also making more um, water in the mitochondria and as I've said before we, we are a giant water being so that's why no matter what whoever I work with I'm not tolerating pro-metabolic or I've tried every way of eating and it's like you know I just think maybe a hundred years ago you could do that but not in this environment so some kind of low carb way of eating I think is important for some people they do actually need to go into ketosis and stay in it because they've got cancer or bipolar or epilepsy but then in saying that there is a beneficial reason to eat seasonal and local vegetables sometimes when they're there or for women who really have trouble with their menstrual cycles it's i mean there's you can get cabbages and things and different vegetables all year round in different places that grow naturally and you know they we're evolved to have them i'm not saying that you know everybody should be keto or carnivore or or whatever i'm just saying you've got to sort of listen to your own body and your own needs because first of all at a hormonal level it can be helpful for some people with leptin and thyroid to break ketosis now and again but then with clients and people life happens and people pretty much break ketosis or whatever naturally because there's a party or a family event or they just feel like it and then they feel really guilty and they like they've done something bad or, or worse they'll binge whereas mm -hmm. a controlled use of um sort of low inflammatory plants or carbs can, can be really helpful and also in the mitochondria when we burn fat as a fuel the the electrons from fat don't go through complex one and that's the one that leaks uh, free radicals so free radicals aren't bad either they're only bad 
when there's too many in the wrong place. So with, with fat, they skip over complex one and just go down complex two, three, four, and five and make water and ATP. The thing is, if complex one was useless, it wouldn't be there. So there is value in pushing electrons through that sometimes because it, it leaks a lot of electrons, sorry, it leaks a lot of free radicals. And, and this can blow up or kill old and damaged mitochondria, which can be really helpful. So it is a sort of part of autophagy that people have not considered um, because again we don't want the sort of older mitochondria hanging around like the government in this country every 10 years or so tries to get all the old banger cars off the road because they're polluting so you can just think of old mitochondria like that um, but again it's always about doing it in a controlled way and also for some people I work with that's not going to work because even a potato would trigger all sorts of um things and then and then those kind of people can take months to get back on the bandwagon again and and I do have friends and I know people who are perfectly happy on keto and carnivore and they're thriving I, I just think you know we're all different we all live in different locations and you need to match your way of eating to where you live and how much sun there is so somewhere like the UK or Scandinavia and Canada as well it's that's a perfect place to do a keto or a carnivore diet because it's cold and it's dark, whereas somewhere more equatorial with sun, it, it, where other kind of fruit grows, it, it might be okay to have some now and again. But if, if you live at the equator, you shouldn't be telling everybody on the planet they must eat all of the fruit and the honey mm -hmm. because they might live in the UK or Seattle or... Um, uh, or somewhere where it's completely inappropriate to eat those kind of fruits because they don't grow there and it's not that your body can't deal with that much sugar and that much deuterium without the sun. Yeah, absolutely. And people who aren't following a ketogenic diet typically are just all over the place and eating, you know, the standard American diet, which is something set between 70 and 80% processed foods, which is really, really scary and completely explains why we have the health issues that we have. And I don't understand why doctors aren't telling people to stop eating the processed foods like oh yeah definitely I, like processed foods are full of deuterium they're full of seed oils but it's also sort of traumatized food and, and again food isn't just calories and hydrogen and electrons it's information um, and, it, and it's not even it's not even proper food and, the, and on, on a quantum level you know we all know it's inflammatory but just putting that chaotic sort of chemical junk into your body and expecting your mitochondria to be all right with that and not to totally create an inflammation bomb yeah. in your body is just complete insanity yeah and, and i don't just that i think earlier you said about the general public being 20 years out of date with the science i think so are the doctors because the doctors and the patients have the same conversation but right. also some doctors eat the standard american diet or they'll yeah. eat a processed vegetarian or vegan diet and i haven't got any issues with vegetarianism i think it's difficult to do and you have to really be strict but people yeah. There's too much processed rubbish to um, tempt people um, with those ways of eating. So they may have been acceptable in certain places 100 years ago. But now, you know, I just think it's, it, 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 you know, advocating or just saying to a patient, oh, why don't you just eat less meat and go vegetarian? They're just going to eat cheese and bread and mm -hmm. goodness knows what else. So and I do know doctors who think they're healthy because they're plant based or, or um, vegetarian and they don't seem to have any concept of what they're doing to their mitochondria. So that's why I, I tend to go for the physics side and start talking about electrons and light and hydrogen, because even though it sounds complicated the first time, all, all doctors went to university, they all know what a mitochondria is. Um, and it's people get very triggered and defensive over food, even if they've got loads of problems themselves and they're misinforming their patients who are just getting bigger and sicker. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to get in the head of a doctor because sometimes I think, are you just so ignorant or, or are you doing it on purpose? That That's the thing. That, that's what yeah. I've always wondered because... I don't know. I mean, you may have spoken to doctors or, or know people and whether it's just pure ignorance or 
they're just uh, and a lot of I have some friends who are doctors and I say that you work in a sausage factory and, and the sausage factory has rules and the doctors, if they disobey the rules of the sausage factory and they tell people to eat meat or they don't prescribe SSRIs or benzos or statins, they get punished. So I, I don't know whether it's the system or the doctor or what, because it just seems for an intelligent person that went to medical school, it's just I can't <laughs> grasp their thought process. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing is just insane to me. So what about um, things like biohacking, like cold therapy? Can we talk about cold therapy and how important that is? I just got an ice bath for Christmas. Yeah, um, I saw you your know. Instagram video of your first you cold plunge. That was ridiculously hard. And I'm telling you, it sat in my living room for three weeks. That's how scared I was. Um, and now I'm doing it every day. And um, I don't love it, which my understanding is that's a good thing because we're supposed to do things that we despise every single day. We're supposed to do things that we do not like every single day to help our brain. And so that's good that I'm making myself do this, but it's really difficult. And I just wonder for people who aren't doing it and don't know, a, like don't understand it, cold showers can do it, a cold bath in your bathtub. But what are the benefits of something like cold exposure? Yeah, first of all, just from an evolutionary perspective, we're meant to be cold adapted. And at the moment, we're just warm adapted because uh, we're not supposed to just live in houses with mm -hmm. heating on. So, so that's already a problem. Yeah. And then another really important aspect of cold exposure is it's, it's anti-inflammatory. It, it makes us produce neurotransmitters like noradrenaline and uh, dopamine and oxytocin. And these are really important if somebody has addictions or, or depression um, or lack of motivation. Then from a diabetes um, and leptin perspective, the brown fat we have, that's nature's answer to, to diabetes. So if we're just sitting inside all day in the warmth where we shrink our brown fat, so we've got less protection against insulin resistance and diabetes. Whereas if we expose the, these areas, like it's, it's around here on the chest and, and collarbone and on at the back of your neck and around your shoulders we need to expose the brown fat to the cold um so the white fat will start to beige and then brown and then we can expand our um brown adipose tissue and this is the one that can ba babies have lots of this and babies are supposed to be in ketosis and that's why they don't like wearing clothes because they're very very cold adapted w whereas with an adult that offers you protection against of blood sugar or insulin related problems so number one uh, the cold thermogenesis is really important for insulin and it's and it can also help with leptin sensitivity as well because again lots of people are leptin resistant or a little bit or a lot leptin resistant so it won't do anybody any harm again like i said it's anti-inflammatory and, and for some people who can't exercise yet a, a cold plunge can be really beneficial from a sort of metabolic standpoint because you're going to cool yourself down your body has to find energy to warm you back up again so it can be a bit like a workout although the way the mitochondria get get more stimulated in cold plunges is different to how it would happen in exercise because when we cool the body down the mitochondria are going to go crazy and make more and more and more heat so that's going to heat the water around in the area when you heat water it actually compresses so it squashes the electron transport chain closer together and any anything in electronics when you make stuff closer together it all works better so so in sort of unpacking that in simple ways that the cold is going to boost your metabolism in several ways and it's going to make your mitochondria more efficient and the more efficient your mitochondria the less inflammation you have and the um, less inflammation you have the less sort of setup you have just for, for weight gain for example because inflammation can lead to, to weight gain along with lots of other things. So I, I would say those are the, the main uh, benefits of doing cold thermogenesis. And I just think it's something that nature provided for us naturally, especially in colder climates, because uh, people who live in the colder climates, their mitochondrial haplogroups are uncoupled. So, so they're designed to be able to make heat uh, instead of, uh, so, that it's so that they can use food and they can make lots of heat because it it would have been a risk living in the UK a thousand years ago and dying of the cold so it's something very normal and very natural so I wouldn't really call it a biohack per se I would I just say it's something people should be doing and in terms of where people start sometimes just opening the windows and turning the heating down 
that's because anything below your own body temperature is cold thermogenesis. And for some people, just doing that for a week is the first step. Um, and then the other thing that people can do is instead of um, jumping out of the shower and rubbing themselves with a towel, they can just stand in the cold air with the window open and dry in the air. And that can be a gentle way in because just if anyone's listening who's got sort of thyroid disease or um, adrenal fatigue, it's not a good idea to do cold plunges yet, but you can do all of the easy things. Uh, and then the, the other thing people can do is a cold face plunge because that's going to stimulate the neurotransmitters. Um, and then people would, you know, they can, like you said, put water in their bath, depending on where they live and the ambient temperature and get in that and get used to the full cold immersion. Because if you do a cold shower, there's, but they're first of all really uncomfortable and it's really difficult to do it for, for ages. But also the medium of um, cold transfer is happening through air, not water. And water's, I think, 10 times better. So, so really, you've got to get the full immersion in the water. And I always say with people, I, I don't necessarily think they should hate it. I think part of cold plunging is when you've got to actually get into it the first time, you've got to force yourself. And it's a bit like forcing yourself to make an Instagram post or write a difficult email. You get used to just doing it. But again, people get really addicted or really into cold uh, therapy or cold thermogenesis because I got massively into outdoor swimming last year. Because again, if you can do cold plunges in water like the ocean or a lake, that's even better because now you've got the ultimate grounding experience and the sunlight. So that's another way to sort of progress with it because sometimes if you make people do something and it's too much for them yet yes it is stressful and it's going to raise cortisol in an unwanted way and they genuinely really don't like it and also for women who have cycles it's not a very good idea to do cold plunges the week before your period or maybe and also maybe the first couple of days but your body will sort of tell you it doesn't really want to so you have to sort of honor that although i know a lot of people who've still cold plunged and or swum in outside and been okay so, so there's a lot to um cold thermogenesis as well and the other really important thing about it is it can make our bodies make um low level ultraviolet light inside us so people who live somewhere cold and they don't have a sun like Canada or the UK, we can sort of make our own internal sunshine using using cold. And then we don't run into so many of the problems of a lack of ultraviolet light. So that would be not being able to make enough dopamine and thyroid and um, other hormones that are dependent on ultraviolet light. Also, you can make neuromelanin or melanin inside you from cold thermogenesis. And that's really important for everything like your nerves all cells have got melanin around them the gut's got melanin in it uh, the brain has loads of it in the substantia nigra so, so there's just numerous benefits of doing cold thermogenesis but it's like everything you, it, you treat it like exercise if you've never exercised before you wouldn't go and do a crossfit class or a, an adult gymnastics class you'd start off with something like uh, Z health, for example, or, or beginners Pilates or sort of mobility for, for men. And then you, you'd move up. So I think a lot of it is people make it too cold too early, because I always say to people, just make it about 55 to 60 Fahrenheit to start with, because some people buy a cold plunge and make it be things like you know 35 Fahrenheit and it's got ice in it and I just think that's such a shock uh, you know just just ease yourself in gradually and, and you don't need to sort of swim in a lake tomorrow just just um treat it like you would doing exercise for the first time or even changing your way of eating because some people really struggle to just suddenly go carnivore overnight they have to go paleo and then low carb and then keto and then they just slide happily into carnivore and and ketovore and they it's all nice and comfortable for them whereas other people i think it's like the pulling off the plaster in one go but versus peeling it off kind of idea with with things i think it's just better with cold plunges to not dive in and also again because of the shock aspect of people who've got any sort of cardiovascular concerns that they, they definitely would need to do the easier cold first but like i said just going outside for a walk and being cold is cold, is cold thermogenesis, same as opening the window. So there's, it's really easy to do uh, when people think about it, because just as a matter of interest, what state are you in and how, what's the temperature of your cold plunge? Me? Um, yeah. I'm in I'm in Virginia, in the United States. And um, so the first time, uh, I can't remember, I think it was 55. I had just filled it that day. So it was about 55 
and it felt very, very cold. Now I will say I made a terrible mistake. This is something you don't hear people talk about. I made a terrible mistake the next day. It was 14 degrees outside. The water temperature was 32. And I thought, what the heck? That was two weeks ago and I'm still paying for it. Um, I think I may have given myself um, frost nip, which is like right before frostbite. Oh yeah, um, yeah. You have to be really careful of ears and toes and, uh, and fingers with cold. Yes. Yeah, it was my fingers. The pain that night was horrendous. I couldn't touch my fingers. I couldn't put my pajamas on. It hurt so badly on my fingers. And then I woke up the next morning with pain here and oh, on yeah. my side here, um, I guess where the skin is more sensitive in those areas. Um, and I'm still suffering. It's still very itchy right in here. Oh, yeah, yeah. It keeps me up at get, night. Yeah. Nerve damage for, because yes. it can't still burn at, uh, and that's why I always say to people, you know, to be careful and, you know, not, to, you're not having a competition with all these right. men online who get in ice baths that they've probably right. practiced for three years, but mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's like, like yeah. anything. That's why I did say at that particular temperature, like 35 Fahrenheit and 32, it, that's mm -hmm. super cold. Yeah, it was very cold. There was a thin layer of ice on it. There was snow everywhere because it had been snowing. Um, it was way too cold. Um, and since then, uh, I, I tried adding, and I had tried adding boiling water that day. I just couldn't get it up. I've tried that a couple of other times, um, but it's been, it's been, 50 degrees, I guess, for the last week. Today it was 45, but I went ahead and did it because now I'm two weeks in and I felt like that five degrees probably isn't gonna make that much of a difference. And I'm fine. I'm, you know, I don't I haven't had any issues. Um, I think the coldest I had done, except for the one really cold one up until today, was maybe 49. You know, it's hard to tell on that little thermometer that they give you, but 49 probably was the coldest until today. And it wasn't any harder to get in and I and I feel fine. So but I wouldn't do 32 again for a really long time. I think that was a little bit extreme. And I wish I hadn't done it. And that would be my advice is to not go too cold too fast because like I said, it's been two weeks and I'm actually still Still dealing with it oh yeah definitely and also I, f I think if people wear booties um or on hand gloves that because yes. with those extremities that's the thing that a lot of the time makes people want to get out is their feet and hands are mm -hmm. so cold whereas the yeah. rest of their body could probably stay in longer because mm -hmm. also how long are you doing cold plunges for because there's a whole world of cold plunging that can go all the way up to hours and hours in the cold no, two to three minutes, depending on the temperature. So at 55 degrees, I'm doing it for three, three and a half minutes. I think I did one four minute one, but with it as cold as it was today, I did two minutes because I, I, I learned my lesson. Yeah. I don't want to overdo it again. Yeah. Once bitten twice shy, as they say, because yeah, yes. also I'm more of a fan of having it a bit warmer and staying in for longer because there's the thing is it's it, there are so many different ways to do it. I know there was a very recent study on in an army barracks where I think they did something like I can't remember the exact time. I think it was a total of eleven minutes per week. And literally in an army barracks, you, you're comparing like with like because they're all the same pretty much and they eat the same. And the benefits from doing even a small amount of cold thermogenesis was massive. And nobody can say, oh, that was a rubbish study or whatever. It was an excellent study. But, but I think it's again, there's a whole lot more to cold thermogenesis because I think it's quite hard to do it in a cold plunge because I find it boring. Whereas if I've got to swim around the lake for an hour in the morning. I've got something to do. So even if I am cold, I'm also moving and busy and looking at the swans and yeah. there's other benefits. But I do agree with you that psychologically you can have a battle with yourself but I think sometimes when you stay in longer you su you suddenly get into this zone because I still find if I go in the lake to swim it takes me five minutes to stop hating it and then I love it whereas that's why with people I sometimes say maybe 10 minutes or 15 because you kind of go into a sort of cold flow state mm -hmm. and uh, even though you're in the bath your body's responding and you're actually warm and you can sit there and meditate and I know people that listen to podcasts and read yeah at all sorts but it's again it's um with cold you can always do more and it's it's definitely if people are struggling with leptin and insulin and weight definitely more is going to be massively beneficial and you okay. can even do it instead of exercise because it's just a different form of metabolic stimulation like i was saying if somebody's hurt themselves or they're too embarrassed to go to the gym or they're too big at the moment the, the cold is massively uh, their friend or so okay. it, it's got lots of other um, uses as well but everybody has to start somewhere you know mm -hmm. like rome wasn't built in a day and all of this and, and you know everything's always a journey so yeah. that that's what i think like and, and like the sunrise some is better than none yeah yeah i love it sarah thank you so much this was really educational and i hope it helps some people today oh no thank you it was lovely to chat with you 
Awesome. Thank you very much. And thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on the Carnivore Revolution.